Hi everyone, thanks very much for taking the time to join us today for a topic that is incredibly important and exciting. It is rare to get to participate in an event like this, in an event where so many different people from different fields are all coming together to discover the solutions that one day will help us fight climate change. We are at the start of something great, and I'm so glad that you're here with us. Let me introduce myself. I'm Megan Leslie, President and CEO of WWF Canada, and I'm joining this call from my home in Ottawa on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people, and I'm grateful to be living and working on and learning about these lands. As the title of the event says, today we're here to talk about catalyzing tools for nature-based climate solutions. Nature-based climate solutions are strategies that use the unique powers of nature to both catch and store carbon. Specifically, we're going to talk about what tools we currently have for measuring carbon in nature and where there's potential for getting better at doing so. And where there is carbon stored in nature, there is nature that's habitat for wildlife, so we can address the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis all at once. We have some amazing speakers joining us today. You're going to hear firsthand from people working on the ground to measure carbon in forests that are regrowing after devastating fires. And at the other end of the spectrum, you'll hear from large multinational corporations who are looking at nature-based climate solutions as part of their CSR commitments, and they're figuring out how to properly track impacts. But before we start, I want to set the stage for, for why this is so important. As I'm sure you know, this summer, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, they issued their latest report on climate change, and that report was called a Code Red for Nature and People. And while a lot of this coverage around the emergency alert was dire, this, this is what I took away from that report. First, we've already altered the planet. But second, limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees is still possible. Just the window for action is narrowing. Third, our actions and choices matter. And fourth, there's hope. We are not too late. There is still time to act, so we better get going. So let's talk about what needs to happen to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. The IPCC report found that it's scientifically still possible only if urgent and scaled up action is taken to reduce emissions. That means rapid and deep cuts to greenhouse gas emissions and using nature-based solutions to capture and store carbon in nature. Now, WWF is a nature and wildlife organization that's been working at the forefront of protecting and restoring nature for over 50 years. We're really excited about the prospect of how nature can be an important tool in the fight against climate change. Currently, one third of climate change causing greenhouse gas emissions, so a third of our GHG emissions, comes from the destruction of trees and ground cover, peatlands, coastal plants and ecosystems. So by preventing the destruction of these natural carbon stores and restoring carbon rich ecosystems, nature can be a third of the solution to reach our emission targets. That's a third of the way there just with nature. And that's why we've made this a top priority in our new 10 year strategic plan at WWF. You may have seen last week, we launched uh, our new plan. We call it Regenerate Canada. And this plan has incredibly ambitious goals around restoring habitats, stewarding and protecting nature and reducing carbon with nature. And in addition to setting these high level goals, almost everything we do now is designed to benefit both wildlife and climate because nature is carbon and nature's habitat. We're doing it because it works. We can tackle climate change and biodiversity loss at the same time with nature. And we're doing it because it's necessary. So here we are with big goals and big plans for catching and storing carbon. Big goals and big plans that we know we can't achieve on our own. So we're restructuring programs and prioritizing new regions here at WWF to ensure that everything we can do will benefit wildlife and climate. But with this new approach comes new challenges, and that's where you come in, because 
you know, generally we know what we need to do. We need to protect intact, intact landscapes that are storing significant carbon. But when it comes to specifics, like which landscapes contain the most carbon and should we should prioritize for protection or calculating how much carbon would be released by new development or understanding how much carbon is prevented from being released if we protect a certain area. Well, those details, we are largely in the dark. And not knowing these specifics and not being able to calculate impact is gonna prevent us from knowing how effective we are. And at a higher level, it'll prevent our country from being able to properly invest in nature as a solution. This is the problem that we're hoping to solve with our latest technology challenge. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about that tech challenge by inviting James Snyder, our VP of Science, Knowledge and Innovation to say a few words. James, welcome. Great, thanks so much, Megan, for that introduction and delighted to be speaking with you all today about the Nature Meets Carbon Technology Challenge. This really is a pivotal moment in terms of the fight against climate change and in terms of protecting biodiversity here in Canada and around the world. In this pivotal moment, we need to be making sure that these nature-based climate solutions, that critical pathway towards meeting our emissions reductions on the, on the way to a 1.5 degree Celsius future, that does so in a way that also benefits, benefits biodiversity. But we also need to measure how we get there, our progress towards those ambitious goals. The Nature Meets uh, Carbon Technology Challenge, we've just launched it, and it, it's an opportunity for us to catalyze new innovation, new approaches to, to answer this specific question. How can we best measure the carbon that's sequestered by our forests, our wetlands, our grasslands? How do we make sure that our protection and management and stewardship of those important carbon storage areas actually are driving those pathways to a 1.5 degrees Celsius future and enabling great community work right across the country. So we're really pleased to be revealing today and asking people to be part of the Nature Meets Carbon Technology Challenge. We'll be learning more about it. And of course, um, that what is a multi-year process and asking for people to apply. The key deadline is November 8th of this year. And we're really excited to hear all of the great projects from right across the country that will enable us to better measure carbon in nature and make sure that nature-based climate solutions in Canada really are on the global stage at leading credible, transparent, and rigorous nature-based climate solutions. November 8th, mark your calendars. See it's there in the, in the chat. Thanks, James. We're really looking forward to hearing more from you in just a few minutes uh, when you'll deep dive, uh, when you do a bit of a deep dive into why we need this tech challenge. And I'm particularly interested in hearing your conversation with Angela Kane, the CEO of Sekwet Makulu Restoration and Stewardship Society, and Garrett Whitworth, the Director of AIB Innovation, about how conservation technology is enabling Indigenous-led conservation. After that conversation, just a bit of a map of how today will work, uh, we'll take a short break and then return with a panel conversation on corporate sustainability and tech that I'll be moderating. And that will feature Michelle Lancaster, the Global Director of Sustainability at Microsoft, and Brian Hong, who's gonna join us from RBC. So stick around to see how these two companies are investing in conservation technology and how they're incorporating nature-based climate solutions into their business plans. Before handing things over to James for the first panel, I'd like to end with one last thing that the authors of the IPCC report said. Every half a fraction of degree of warming matters. Every year matters. And every choice matters. Said another way, what we do today directly affects the vulnerability of current and future generations to climate change. And what we want to do here today, and with the Nature Meets Carbon Tech Challenge, we want to do is invent and build. We want to design and bring to life the technologies and solutions that will enable us to reduce our vulnerability to climate change and get us on track. Thanks for joining us today on this exciting journey. James, to you. Great. Thanks so much for that, Megan. I should quickly introduce myself. So James Snyder, I'm the VP of the Science Knowledge Innovation Team at WF Canada. I'm joining you today from my home in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, 
and home to many diverse Indigenous people. I'm really delighted today to be speaking with Angela Kane, CEO of the Step One Makulu Restoration and Stewardship Society, and as well as Garrett Whitmore, Director of AIB Innovation. I've had the privilege of working with Angie and Garrett over the last year or so in terms of the work that they have underway to restore um, a, an incredible area uh, within the interior of BC that's had um, hard impacts of, of, of forest fire. You're going to hear more about that in a moment. And that the, the broad scale efforts to restore um, and regenerate, as Angie will tell us, um, those traditional territories of the Sepulmic people. Um, and learning about how those efforts, of course, can also generate and sequester carbon in those trees, in those soils, and asking the question, how can technology help enable this work into the future? How can technology support, make these efforts achieve all that the Sepulmic people, that the SRSS is, is trying uh, to, to put together over the coming decade? Um, and so with that, I'm, I'm going to hand things over to Angie uh, and say, well, Angie, I'd like us to, if you could please, you know, provide a quick introduction of yourself and tell us a little bit more about Sepulmekulu, the Stewardship and Restoration Society, your objectives, and really what you're trying to achieve as an organization. Okay, thank you very much for um, inviting us to speak today. Um, it's always something that's uh, very um, dear to my heart, um, the land and the preservation and restoration of it. Um, my name is Angela Kane. I join you today from the unceded traditional territory of the Tecumloops First Nations, who are at the heart of the Chequetmic Nation. I'm the CEO for the Chequetmic Ulu. <clears throat> sorry, Restoration and Stewardship Society. Um, for the last 20 years, I have been advocating for and supporting First Nation communities in their economic endeavors. Um, prior to becoming the CEO, um, I was a band lands and natural resource manager for one of our communities, High Bar First Nations, um, that was impacted by the 2017 Elephant Hill wildfire, which destroyed almost 192,000 hectares of um, traditional territory, which was shared by about eight communities. The SRSS was founded in 2019 by the eight communities um, to advance the restoration and stewardship of the Shkwetmikulu. Um, it was at this time that I accepted the role as uh, CEO. We are governed by our chiefs and our natural resource and cultural heritage staff um, that are from our member communities. Our guiding principles are developed um, to guide unity and collaboration. We have um, incorporated the approach of walking on two legs, which is one of Indigenous knowledge and the other of Western science. We're also um, through restoration revitalization, um, resilience and innovation, and ad advocacy and stewardship. And focusing on these principles, we're building and improving and expanding on our achievements and being at the forefront of advancing stewardship and caretakership of our Tamuk. We also allows us to have meaningful collaboration while working together in unity. The upholding of our Shekwetmik Unity Declaration in 2012, um, <clears throat> while also utilizing the memorial to Sir Wilfred Laurier in 1910, I'm sorry, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat this morning, <clears throat> and the Declaration of Understory, which is something that we implemented after the fires, and it's the understory is our plants, our medicines, um, the the basically the the ground shrubbery that a lot of our First Nations communities utilize for their teas and medicines. Um, through these principles, we're able to supporting our Shikwetmik in the protection and sustainable management of the Shikwetmik Ulu. And we're also developing Shikwetmik land and resource management standards and practices as we've been managing and using these forests since time immemorial and will continue to do so to manage all the forests and lands and for plants and medicines. Thank you so Thank much you. for that, for that, Angie. Um, really appreciate that overview of, of your work with SRS. I'm really delighted to be speaking with you today. Um, I also want to bring Garrett Whitmore into the conversation. Hi, Garrett. Thanks for joining us. Garrett, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work with SRSS over the last years. Gary, I think you're on, on, on mute there. 
Thank Thanks, you. James. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking from the traditional territory of the Tecumseh people. And I'd also like to thank uh, the WWF for this opportunity. Um, from my time at uh, SFU as a PhD candidate and at MIT as a postdoctoral fellow, I've been heavily involved in academic research from a chemical biology and a biochemistry perspective. When AIB Innovation was started, our goal was to bring academic research to our partners to enhance innovation and solve difficult environmental problems. When we first started working with the, the SRSS, it was to quantify the above ground biomass and soil carbon both inside and outside the Elephant Hill fire area. What we found was a significant loss of soil carbon, organic material, and soil compaction due to the fire. This leads to lower water and nutrient holding capacity, which in turn reduces plant growth and makes them more susceptible to the effects of climate change. We saw evidence of this in the high plant mortality rates from the extended heat waves that we experienced this summer. So my role, along with our partner company, Second Pass Forestry, is to help the SRSS identify new methods that combine traditional knowledge along with climate adaptation technologies to replenish the soil carbon in order to successfully rehabilitate the fire damaged landscapes in our area. Thanks for that, Garrett, and um, great to be speaking with you today. Um, you know, bringing Angela back into the conversation, you know, Ange Garrett mentioned that the, the heat this past year and, you know, the, I think the entire country, really many parts of the entire world were really watching what's happening here in Canada, both in terms of the heat and, and the fires. I wonder if, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the heat dome and the impacts that had on your efforts? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the efforts uh, or projects that we've been working on for the last couple of years is the BC Salmon Innovation and Rehabilitation Project through uh, Department of Fisheries. We identified about 80 kilometers of riparian streams, um, fish bearing, well, not all of them, but some of them are fish bearing streams, but the others contribute to um, the health of the salmon streams. Our goal is to replant um, mostly deciduous and pine, um, basically to put back uh, for what was there previously and not um, have the forest put back as pine plantations or more economic um, values, but more along the lines of ecological values. And so this past year, um, we were able to start planting and um, we had a successful planting season and unfortunately we finished in um, June and shortly after July when the heat dome hit it actually killed about 90 percent of the plants that we had um, planted this year. So it, I was also told by our RPF that it you know it, it was so devastating that it had also um, destroyed two three and five-year-old trees. So and that, you know, this heat dome is not something that's just a one off. It's something that we're going to be seeing more and more of. So we're now taking a look at how can we better protect um, our little seedlings and our plants that are coming uh, that'll be coming up next year for planting. Um, so that's going to be an ongoing uh, conversation and uh, we'll be looking at different uh, innovative ideas to make sure that we have some survive a higher survival rate for next year. Yeah, th thanks for that, Angie. And it certainly, you know, the impacts of the fires were were, were very clear in the in the heat. And looking ahead at what the that change in climate might mean in terms of these efforts on the ground and how can we can adapt and build a broader resilience into these ecosystems is so critically important right now. Um, mm -hmm. The origins of, of of your work in many ways, I think, date back to the Elephant Hill fire. And I think you mentioned that in your introduction in terms of what was a, a really massive fire within the region. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that fire and 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 really kind of how did that kick started your work uh, it, through SRSS and in, in the region and, and kind of your broader efforts there and some of the impacts of the fire in the community at large. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, in 2017, like I said, we'd uh, seen about 192,000 hectares burn. And um, the impacts were um, devastating to our communities. It was a loss of, you know, the traditions that they normally 
are able to do, like they're collecting their their medicines and their teas, their wildlife. Um, you know, it was the fire was so hot in areas that it became this deadpan soil where there was um, no moisture could seep into the ground. And so come spring, we saw um, landslides and um, actually we had a landslide uh, that was a uh, took a life, um, which was really sad within one of our communities. Um, the what we're seeing um, is that um, the impacts from the fire are not just physical, they're also emotional. We had a lot of our community members um, that really suffered traumatic experiences during the fire. Um, I can give you an example of, we had one um, gentleman, he was watching as the fire was approaching across the field and saw his granddaughter playing in the pool out in the backyard and he had seconds to grab her and put her in the car and, and take off before the fire actually engulfed his house. He watched it as he was driving away in the in the rear view mirror. Those are things that don't leave you. Those are things that are that stay with you for a long time. And even now they're still, you know, impacted that way. But our role is to um, help our communities um, recover and restore um, from an ecological base. Um, but by doing this, it also helps on a emotional and mental base by seeing their the replanting of our areas salmon is sacred to for our first nation communities so seeing those areas restored and rehabilitated is also um, coming back as a as an emotional piece as well thank you for sharing that angie and wow i mean it's frightening and, and really quite tragic, the stories that you shared there in terms of the impacts uh, that people have had on certainly the fires in, within the community at large. Uh, and, and so they can see loud and clear um, why SRS is doing the work that you're doing. Um, you, you've spoken a little bit about the, the broad scale uh, replanting efforts um, and the large area of forest that was impacted by the Elephant Hill fire. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, how did the question of, of carbon, how did, how did that side of things sort of creep into the conversation and become part of your work? How, how, does, how does that um, factor in to your efforts through SRSS within the region? Actually, the carbon efforts was brought to our table. Um, we have um, our what we call our um, First Nations tech table. And so usually that's our natural resource managers and technicians from each of our communities come to sit at our table. We have a monthly meeting and um, Second Pass, who is a partner with um, AIB, um, came to the table and was mentioning to us about carbon initiatives. And to be honest with you, I didn't have a clue what the heck that was <laughs> when they first brought it to the table. Um, and I'm still learning. So forgive me uh, for my ignorance in this area. That's why we have Garrett. Um, and, but I, you know, in them explaining it and, and um, the opportunities of the carbon monitoring and the carbon credits and, and what that meant actually got me really excited because I thought it, this, here's a new opportunity or a new um, area that First Nations can get in on the ground and actually have a say in how this innovation or how this process works within their within their um, their territories and also to the opportunity for um, economic um, opportunities for communities um, so currently we're we're looking at um, what that means and, and and investigating and exploring further um, with the help of Garrett and um, a second pass in what that means to to the SRSS and how can we implement it and how can we be at the forefront and of innovation and just basically how can we be there to um, help bring forward this carbon monitoring and by combining the efforts that we're doing right now. Maybe a great opportunity to bring Garrett into the conversation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I, I wonder, Garrett, can you tell us a little bit more about the efforts that you're doing on, on carbon monitoring specifically with SRSS? And also, how is technology part of that? Or how do you envision technology being a bigger part of that into the future? Yeah, so I'll I'll talk about kind of the, the technology uh, that we've used 
the right now uh, and then get to the, the card monitoring in a second here. Um, currently, we've used uh, drones uh, with thermal cameras to identify uh, cold water upwellings in rivers that are susceptible to drought so that uh, rehabilitation work can be targeted around these critical salmon resting areas. And this this is a pretty effective uh, method of doing that. It's really quite a neat, a neat uh, use for, for UAVs. Um, we've also used kind of basic remote sensing technology to get a better understanding of the extent of the fire. Um, for the future uh, of what the SRSS is doing, I think any technology that can combine burn intensity maps uh, with regional soil carbon data to predict soil carbon loss post fire would be very valuable uh, to what the SRSS wants to accomplish. Uh, this would require that uh, we build kind of a baseline soil carbon inventory for the region, but if we can reliably model post fire soil carbon, it would allow the SRSS to prioritize areas and identify optimal planting regimes based on the remaining carbon in the soil um, and optimizing future soil carbon and survivability of the plants in the face of climate change. Uh, this is this is a critical uh, path uh, because using a blanket plan for rehabilitation in, in the region of the world that we're working in right now, it's not going to really work anymore. Um, kind of what we've noticed is that uh, this area, it's, it's almost like the proverbial, proverbial uh, kind of bird in the cage where <clears throat> we're, we're feeling the effects of kind of climate change uh, before uh, the majority of the planet. It's a sensitive area already, and then when you throw on top uh, heat domes and regular devastating forest fire seasons, it's really making it very difficult to uh, do the rehabilitation work that needs to get done. And so that's that's kind of what led us to uh, the carbon question. Uh, the, the soils, the fires, they've basically um, stripped carbon out of the soils. And getting a better knowledge of, of kind of what carbon what carbon was there before the fires, what carbon is there afterwards, and then creating these uh, planting regimes and uh, carbon sequestration regimes to one, merge traditional knowledge with uh, adaptation technologies and, and successfully rehabilitate these areas through uh, a strong carbon um, protocol, I guess is is going to be critical to uh, moving forward successfully and, and being able to successfully rehabilitate uh, these areas. Th thanks for that, Garrett. And I'm starting to see some questions rolling here in, in the chat and the Q&A. Um, I want to take the moment to invite our audience to, to submit some questions there for Garrett and Angie um, as we hear about their work as part of the Sepamakula Restoration and Stewardship Society. Um, and of course, the, the broad scale restoration efforts that they're doing in the region, seeing some coming in there. So I ask you all to, to put in your questions in the Q&A. Um, so the, the, here's a question for both Angela and, and, and Garrett. You know, so we're, we're speaking today about the Nature Meets Carbon Technology Challenge. And I wonder if you, if you can tell us a little bit about how new tools might support your efforts by SRSS. Maybe Angie, some thoughts there, and we've heard a little bit from Garrett as well. Yes, sure. Um, well, actually, through the help of WWF and um, Second Pass and AIB, we were able to create a training video and um, data collection um, process protocols, which we would like to start implementing um, on a broader base within our communities. Um, I know like Garrett had mentioned LIDAR and remote sensing, and these are some some really innovative ideas that we've actually used in the past um, for some identifying some areas. And um, so for us, looking at new technology um, will only increase our efforts um, in capturing the carbon credits and um, looking, being at that forefront of innovation and technology. So 
I'm, I'm I apologize, but I'm not um, too up on the um, the technology piece. Um, but I would leave that to Garrett to kind of fill in the gaps for me there. Yeah, understood. That's great. Maybe Garrett, over to you then, in terms of other thoughts there. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think this is a, a great opportunity. Um, in my experience, you never know where a solution to a problem may come from. My background's in chemistry and biochemistry, and uh, without the, some of the excellent partners that we have in Second Pass Forestry, uh, I would never know how valuable that would be uh, in the forestry and agricultural realms, uh, particularly with uh, soil carbon sequestration. You get nutrient binding, soil bacteria, aeration, these all play significant roles in uh, rehabilitation and climate change adaptation. And they operate on chemical and biochemical principles. Uh, so that, that crosstalk between uh, different areas, whether it's, it's software development or physics or biology or agriculture, being able to reach out to people who, who maybe you've got innovators out there, they've got a technology that's ready to go. Maybe it's working in agriculture. Uh, they just need someone to identify the problem for them and to start working with them. So the NatureX Carbon Challenge to me uh, has the opportunity to connect innovators with carbon project developers uh, with the goal of solving real world problems. And, and I really love the idea of uh, reaching out to kind of as many people as possible to, to get that crosstalk going and, and get, get knowledge from experts in different fields to start, start working with the people that on the ground that uh, like the SRSS that want to want to do this work and and provide them with the, the technology and the innovation to, to do this more effectively, more efficiently. Uh, because I mean, realistically, there's a lot of uh, information that, that we don't know right now. And uh, there's changing landscapes, the, the fires and the heat domes are, are causing havoc and we're gonna have to gain uh, a lot more information before we can, can really do this uh, successfully and efficiently. So. Bringing, bring people from all different walks of walks of life and, and knowledge uh, is going to be great. I really think this is a, a great opportunity. OK, Gary, th thanks for, for sharing about your thoughts around the role of the Nature Meets uh, Carbon Technology Challenge and, and the role there um, of, of innovation in this space and what that can mean in terms of collaboration and, and fostering uh, new ideas and new approaches to increase the impact of the work that you're doing in the region. We've got some great questions rolling in in the Q&A here. I'm really to decide, uh, excited to see this come in and I ask our audience, of course, to please share any questions that come to mind that you might have for Angie and Garrett. Um, right off the top here, um, I think, Angie, this might be something for, for you, um, a question of um, the kinds of trees and plants that you and the communities are, are, are including as part of your efforts right now. Can you tell us a little bit more? about the wet trees and the plants and also the other kind of efforts that you're doing? Are there other uh, non-tree planting efforts that you're doing in the region? Um, yes, sure. Actually, we, for our deciduous trees, um, we're putting back aspen, willow, cottonwood, um, and I believe some, I'm pronounced this right, supalali, um, a traditional plant. So. Those are the main focus for our deciduous and around our riparian areas. Um, we ban this year we'll be increasing our buffer zones from 25 meters to 50 meters so that we can encompass a larger area. Our main goal is to try and decrease the temperature in the waters for the salmon habitat. Um, the other efforts we're doing, like we've, SRSS has done a few different things. Um, after the fires, what we saw or one of our major concerns was the mushrooms that would have been coming back um, post fire and the concerns of the mushroom pickers that would be coming and the impacts that they would leave on the land. So through Red Cross, we were able to access some funds to create a territorial patrol, which in turn um, monitored the mushroom pickers. We developed a permitting system to track buyers and pickers on the, the land. We also provided um, makeshift campsites that had garbage collection and uh, porta potties. So through those efforts, we were able to remove 24,000 tons of 
garbage and 15,000 tons of human waste off that would have been left on the land. So it gave us an opportunity to um, put our community members out on the land to um, be stewards, to share information um, of our communities as well as share um, you know, concerns that they have around the impacts that were happening. That was one of the things that we were able to implement. This will be something that we'll be looking for uh, to re-implement on the three major fires that we had within basically the same communities, traditional territories um, that we saw this year. And we're also, we work with the province to do monitoring um, pre and post harvest um, of the forests. So doing lots of different opportunities. That's, am that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, you know, I was really excited about the Merle Harvard's piece of work, Angie, what, and you know, I've heard about that and certainly heard from you more of those efforts and uh, the connection here in terms of you know, community livelihoods, well-being, um, direct use of, by the community, I think is such an important part of of your work and the efforts that, you, that the SRSS has been doing and seeing now I think it's so apparent um, the connection between the the riverine work that you're doing the the broader riparian zone efforts the connection now to fire and fire disturbance um, and how a changing climate um, impacts all three of those systems that to me only reinforces how important the broad scale works that you're doing within the region, within the Sepoimek territories to build broader resilience. Um, you know, one, one side of things that you, you did mention, um, I think right from the onset, is looking to kind of more traditional indigenous management approaches on the land um in in terms of rather than kind of a more typical approach that's being kind of uh, used especially from a forest management perspective today um can you speak a little bit more about that in terms of you know, like the a more traditional approach and, and what that means in terms of uh how you are building different values on the landscape what, what does that mean for you and, and the communities that are involved in srss um what that means for us is going back to um, traditions that the Shaquetmik have have traditionally used. Uh, and one of the biggest ones that um, I can identify right now is cultural burning. Um, 50 years ago, we uh, the province decided that cultural burning should not be allowed anymore. And we are now seeing the devastating effects of that forest management practice. Um, currently, we're working with the province on redeveloping um, that cultural burning and bringing that back. I mean, traditionally, um, by cultural burning, it would bring back the new fresh plants and medicines um, or the plants that were utilized for medicines, they'd come back fresh and new. And this was the, the traditional way of regenerating and renewing your, your plants and your medicines to make sure that they were uh, more viable that, that season, but also to, to manage um, and protect um, for wildlife, um, you know, the grasses for the for the mule deer and the moose and the elk within the areas. So by going back to that traditional way of life, we're reinvigorating the forests for to be healthier and more for an economic and not economic ecological aspect rather than an economic. And that's where we're really um, pushing back and really trying to advocate for the fact that we need to go back to those traditional ways of management to see a healthier forest for future generations. Also too, um, you know, with these devastating wildfires, um, we're seeing licensees take down our aspen, which are actually a natural fire break. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why too, that um, we created harvesting principles within um, the Elephant Hill area that and civil culture principles that you know to put back they had to put back those traditional species so that we could see a healthier forest. So we have been able to implement that within our our area and we are the first of its kind in BC and now the province is looking to um, expand on that model into different areas. Seems like tremendous potential there, and certainly an area that I'm really keen to learn more from in terms of your efforts and, and, and something that 
arguably has has uh, tremendous precedence in terms of uh, forest management practices, not only in BC but elsewhere in the in the country, and um, how that delivers, you know, direct benefit to local communities. How that direct benefits carbon, carbon storage. I mean, all of these pieces come together in, uh, in terms of the broader resilience of the forest and understanding the cultural burning part of the equation. And these are, I think, really uh, inspiring questions that uh, I know that many of us in the conservation community um, have top of mind. Um, one thing that really struck me when we were speaking the other day, we we're talking about the, the fires in the region this past summer, right? And the, I think really right across the country, all eyes are on BC, um, and, and especially in, in the interior and uh, really within your home, your traditional territories. Uh, and you were sharing with me the, the, the size of the, some of the forests that were lost. Is that something that you can share with our audience? I think you mentioned a, a harvest area or a lot will cut from one of the communities in the, on the order of hundreds of thousands of hectares. Is that right? Um, actually, yes. One of our communities, the uh, Skeechison Indian Band, um, they have a wood lot and wood license. And I was informed by them there was one of the larger fires um, called Sparks uh, Fire, which is was right at their community. They lost over uh, nine, million, 9 million cubic meters, um, which meant that they lost their wood lot, they lost their wood license, and a huge area of um, their traditional territory due to the fire. And actually there was another one, um, I'm trying to, so I can explain this in a vision. So Skeechison is kind of in a valley and the Thompson River runs between uh, in the middle of their traditional territory and they had two fires impact them this year which was the Tremont Creek fire which was on the south side of the Thompson River and then the Sparks Lake fire which was on the north side and both of these fires just pretty much decimated their traditional territory. Um, we already have seen impacts of mudslides which water came uh, when we had the rains here this past um, August or sorry, September, um, they've seen, they had eight um, just within their community. And so now they're they're bracing for the spring, um, which will bring many more and uh, slides and devastation due to the fires. Mm. Well, the, the connections again, reinforced, you know, between the management of the forests, the approaches we take there, um, and again, the, the riverine systems and the community livelihoods uh, and, Community well-being. I mean, I mean, uh, it, some of what you've just shared there is so uh, really devastating, and tragic in terms of the loss of those ecosystems that have been managed for so many years. Um, one question I think that that um, it, through the eyes of the technology challenge and kind of what Garrett was speaking to earlier that really struck me was trying to understand how um, these fires actually impact stored carbon in the soil. Right. You know, we, we can envision, and I think our minds. Um, how the, the forest fires are impact the loss of vegetation in, in our in our tree ecosystems in the forest. But I wonder, Garrett, can you speak to us about how we measure or might measure the loss of carbon in our soils? And we know that that's such an important carbon storage area. Yeah, and um, it is a very important uh, carbon storage area, particularly for uh, the interior region here at BC, because uh, we're already operating on uh, on low uh, carbon storage <clears throat> before the fires hit and that carbon storage is so important for uh, keeping the nutrients uh, in the ground for uh, rehabilitation, regrowth and then also pulling water in. So Angela mentioned uh, landslides and uh, we're going to get we're going to see erosion happen. The more carbon you have in that soil, the less uh, these impacts are. You can you can pull more water out so you, you're not actually having any erosion. Um, and uh, and it helps you help carbon helps you get a, a surface cover back on there to uh, reduce the impact of, of landslides. Um, so uh, the monitoring currently uh, that we're doing it, it's it's mostly kind of boots on the ground going out and uh, collecting collecting soil samples, getting them tested for total organic carbon, uh, looking at the bulk density of the soil, uh, the compaction, and I think uh, if we can bring kind of technology into this, there's there's a lot of work in academia uh, 
looking at the uh, burn intensities and how they uh, impact soil carbon loss. If we can can get good modeling systems up and running where um, knowing just knowing the burn intensity that goes across the landscape and having having a good uh, soil carbon uh, database existing, we can then go out and, and just model um, the soil carbon post fire. Uh, that, that would help out immensely uh, in, from a technology aspect as to, to future planning and to, to being able to identifying these these planting regimes that cross traditional uh, traditional planting knowledge and traditional plants with uh, the climate adaptation technology uh, that we're going to need to to successfully uh, complete these rehabilitation programs. Thanks, Dr. Care. I, we're seeing lots of great questions come in here through the the Q and A. I'm so happy to have these questions from our audience now. Um, just looking at the clock, I think we probably have time for maybe one more question uh, before we get ready for our, our next session. Um, and so, I'm, you know, I'm looking here. One of the, uh, I think, big questions here that resonated with me was you know, how do the impacts of the fires like Elephant Hill extend beyond the region? And I guess the other one, maybe kind of looking ahead, is you know, how do we get people right across the country to be kind of more engaged and to be, to care more and become more involved to help support your work, right? In terms of building the broader resilience um, of the forest within the, the traditional territory of the Sacramento people. Um, maybe you have some thoughts there, Angie? Um, yeah, you, you kind of caught me off guard there. <laughs> <laughs> no um, problem. So, you know, I think the thing is, is for people to just educate themselves on, you know, our, the forest management across across the country. Go out, take a look. And I mean, it doesn't take much to go out and um, drive your back roads and see the impacts of um, forestry, harvesting um, our trees and, and what's happening there and what's being put back. And um, and I know for me, um, it doesn't take much for me to go in my backyard as it's I'm surrounded by forests all the time. But, you know, I, I see the, the current forest practices and the devastation of those practices. Um, I, it, it's, it's education. It's understanding what our current impacts are and looking, um, you know, to our First Nations um, for guidance on how do we do this better? How do we um create a thriving forest full of biodiversity and wildlife and um make sure that it's preserved there for our future generations um i know you know that's something that we're constantly aware of is that you know we're putting back for future generations we're um looking at you know how do we best preserve um something that is that is so important um, to us physically as well as spiritually and emotionally. And, um, you know, I just wanted to recap on on a piece there when we were talking about the um, the deciduous trees. Uh, we struggled this year um, or last year when we were looking for seeds and by the harvesting and the forest practices that we have to go out traditionally get seeds that are within our area to replant is they're so minimal. Uh, they're just they're not available and that's something that we need to look at for future and it's one thing that SRSS is looking at doing is having starting our own nursery to support the aspen and the birch and the and um, these deciduous trees which are so important to our forests and carbon um, sequestering so I hope I answered your question no absolutely you did I'm so happy that you mentioned the, the the seed bank and access to seeds and we have you know really ambitious work that we want to do together and I think others right across the country do as well in terms of uh, broad scale restoration efforts regenerating Canada so to speak and we need that those great native seed banks to really be the basis of of, of writing the right or planting the right trees the right species in, in the right, right places um, so thank you for bringing that into the into the conversation today with that I really want to thank. Garrett and Angie uh, for, for joining the conversation, for being part of this event with us today. It really was uh, an insightful and inspiring conversation. I thank you so much for your time today and for being part of this.
And with that, I'll hand it back over to Meg and Leslie. Thanks, James and Angie and Garrett. That was that was really fantastic. Um, I hung on your every word. Thanks for bringing to life uh, why this kind of work is so important and what's needed. And Garrett, as you said, we're we're here because we're trying to solve real world problems. So what a fantastic beginning. I do want to thank Angela and Garrett one more time for joining us and sharing their insights into carbon monitoring and measurement. And for those of you who are just joining, my name is Megan Leslie. I'm president and CEO of WWF Canada. And you join just in time for our second panel because uh, we've got a great discussion coming up. I think you're going to enjoy it. So let me introduce our next panel on corporate sustainability and technology. Joining me today are Michelle Lancaster, the Global Director of Sustainability at Microsoft, and Brian Hong, Senior Manager Social Impact, RBC Tech for Nature. Brian and Michelle, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think we have a unique opportunity here to learn directly about your support for conservation technology and to see how nature-based climate solutions are fitting into corporate climate commitments and strategies. Uh, I know I really will appreciate the window into this. So let's get started. Michelle, um, please welcome, please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about how Microsoft is working to address the dual crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. Wonderful, and thank you so much for having me. I, I'm not Canadian, but I'm really excited to join a whole bunch of my favorite Canadians um, from my uh, not very sunny basement here in Seattle, living up to um, its expectation. At Microsoft, um, investing in nature and protecting biodiversity and climate change go hand in hand. Um, we have been carbon neutral from 2013 um, up until 2020. Last year, we committed to be a carbon negative company by 2030. Um, for us, that means minimizing um, our scope one and two emissions down to about zero um, and then doing quite a bit of work in our scope three emissions to cut that by 55%. But the last bit of the work on um, that remaining 45 percent of our emissions in scope three which are the bulk of our emissions um they can't be reduced any further we are really reliant on carbon removal and investing in nature to get us the rest of the way to carbon negative i mean we're not alone we know that the ipcc report indicates that there's no way to get anywhere close to the paris goals without investing in nature it uh both protecting what we have today and better investing in protecting what's there in the future to harness sequestration as well as resilience is something that's critical to the future of the planet it's imperative to our goals and that's why we've committed both our capital our commitments um, and then also our technology prowess um, to really bring data and AI to build the markets to do this, to do it well, to make sure that dollars flow into the right places and that we're protecting as much as we can, as fast as we can, because we don't have a lot of time um, either. But we are still climate optimists um, over here and we've seen firsthand um, what uh, an ambitious commitment um, from the top of the company, as well as dollars devoted to this, um, can really make a difference quite quickly. And we're really um, enthusiastic about um, what we've seen from the corporate community when it comes to investing in nature over the past year. Michelle, just before we go to Brian, this is an ambitious commitment. And I kind of, maybe you can paint a picture for us a little bit of what that means about how Microsoft operates. Yeah, I love this question um, because it gives me a chance to be very honest with people. Um, I think there are two ways to go about corporate goal setting in organizations. Um, one is to have a fully baked roadmap and get people bought in on the art of the possible. Um, we did not do that. We did the opposite, which is to get people bought in on what needs to be done, um, build enough of the roadmap to get corporate approval and then move forward. Um, we have very clear roadmaps. We've already made a ton of progress against those commitments. Um, last year, we issued the largest corporate RFP for carbon removal, including, including engineered, but also nature-based solutions, which made up about 70% of the final purchase portfolio that we had. Um, so we've purchased up to 1.3 million metric tons of CO2 removal. Um, our RFP is currently open again, if there's anybody in the market that would like to share their proposals with us. Um, but it really was a conversation at the company um, that started with three questions. Um, the first was, are we doing enough? Clearly, no, no company can answer that question credibly today with a straight face and say that they are. The science indicates otherwise. Um, the second question we asked ourselves 
was could any one company make a difference? Um, and that really caused some soul searching inside of what it meant to set commitments, not just as corporate commitments, but really to put the harness um, around the biggest power that we have at Microsoft, which is not our operations, but is our power of technology and our customer engagements to work for us on this. And so we decided if we did that, if we really put our core competency on technology to work for climate, then yes, we could, probably could um, make a difference. And the third question um, that we asked ourselves was how high should we aim? And it was a very clear answer for us from the C-suite um, was to do as much as we thought that we should do and then do a little bit more. Um, it's not an easy task. I think, um, you know, we know that the market needs to grow dramatically. We need to do a ton of work with our suppliers. Um, but it's just too obvious to us to look at the global science right now. We're a data-driven company after all, um, and the data is telling us that everybody needs to aim higher, and Microsoft happens to be in a position where we can do more because we are a very large company that has, you know, a currently a trillion dollar valuation. And so we decided that we needed to do more, we could do more, and those that can do more should do a lot more. Um, and that means setting the bar on where the science says we need to go, not where we think that we can actually get to by 2030. Although we're pretty sure we can still get there by 2030. Um, but it was ambition first, roadmap second. I love it. I love it. And uh, when you said that you can make a difference, it's like music to my ears. So thank you for that. I can't wait to dive in a bit more with you uh, in a minute. But Brian, I want to welcome you and also extra extra thanks for you um, to you for stepping in at the last minute. This is your area of expertise, so we're pretty lucky that you could join us. Please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about how RBC is working on biodiversity loss and climate change. Thanks so much, Megan, and, and thanks to WWF for, for having me here today. Uh, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that um, I'm here in my home in Toronto, which is the land, uh, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, yeah, so in my in my role right now, I'm managing uh, RBC's environmental donation strategy, RBC Tech for Nature, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that addresses uh, our, the biodiversity crisis. But first, I wanted to touch on how RBC is also uh, addressing climate change. So RBC is led by what we call the RBC Climate Blueprint. And it's our enterprise strategy to accelerate clean economic growth and support our clients and communities in a socially inclusive transition to net zero. And I do want to say Microsoft's been a really great uh, leader in this space. And in my previous role, when I was working on um, setting the climate blueprint and our targets and our strategy, we did look to Microsoft uh, a lot as, as we do see them as major leaders. So thanks for your work in, in leading the whole corporate sector, Michelle. Um, so we originally published our climate blueprint in November of 2019 and have since updated it twice, once in June 2020 and once in February 2021. Um, and that really, I think, goes to show just how quickly this the, the nature of climate change is changing, the conversations that are changing. Um, and we also had to update it because we did achieve uh, what we thought were ambitious goals back when we launched in 2019, but have since updated the, the blueprint with even more ambitious goals, which set us out till 2025. Uh, and the climate blueprint has five different pillars. So one is supporting clients in the net zero transition with our products, services, and advice. And the key target here is to provide $500 billion in sustainable finance by 2025. And this is one of the targets um, that we had to reissue. It was originally $100 billion by 2025, and we achieved that uh, a few years early. Uh, our second pillar is around advancing capabilities in climate risk management and committing to publish annual TCFD disclosures. So we're one of the first organizations to take part in the TCFD uh, disclosure process and have been publishing them annually, I think, since 2018. Um, three is the pillar that I previously worked on, which was to achieve carbon neutrality in our own operations uh, each year. Um, and we have two targets now uh, beyond that. So one, to be a carbon neutral organization, yes, but also to uh, reduce our absolute GHG emissions from scope one and scope two uh, by 70% by 2025 and to increase our electricity to 100% from non-emitting sources by 2025. 
and uh, four, to be more, uh, to speak up for smart climate solutions. So I'm really excited about this. Um, you're going to start hearing more from RBC around uh, the issues of climate and also climate opportunities. Um, so please stay tuned for that. And then lastly, pillar five is investing in technology to address complex environmental challenges. And that's where RBC Tech for Nature lies. So through Tech for Nature, we are helping to address uh, the biodiversity crisis as well. We funded numerous programs focused solely on biodiversity, but also many programs focused on land conservation and water that also protect and enhance biodiversity. And just one example I wanted to touch on, uh, which it's a program that I really like, uh, it's a partnership with Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, Birds Canada and NatureServe Canada, who are jointly working on what's called the Canadian Key Biodiversity Program. And this program is using a global standard that uses a scientific approach um, to identify the areas that are really important for biodiversity. And this is extremely important work uh, because the federal government, as we know, does have a commitment to conserve 30% of Canada's landmass by 2030. So this program is going to help drive um, and, and show of that 30% that we're going to conserve, how do we do that in the best possible way that creates the best outcomes uh, for biodiversity? Uh, so that's just one example. And uh, yeah, looking forward to chat more. Great, Brian, this is a perfect segue because I really want to hear from both of you about some examples of your work to you know, get our creative minds turning, those of us who are, who are in this webinar. So Brian, I'm going to continue with you. Um, that was a great example. What do you what do you see as the role of technology in conservation? And maybe can you give us some more examples, some some of your best examples of how it's working? Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, so I think just to take a step back, um, like the reason we're even thinking about technology and conservation and nature is that one of the biggest issues with climate change is that it's accelerating faster than many of the solutions we have that to meet the challenge. Um, so that's really why we wanted to focus on technology for our environmental donation strategy to accelerate the action and the solutions and kind of create these solutions that can meet that, uh, that uh, rising challenge. So we think technology is going to play a huge role in conservation going forward, um, whether that's identifying the most impactful or at-risk areas to conserve, um, highlighting areas especially important for biodiversity, as I just previously mentioned, um, or more human things like connecting people to nature through augmented reality or virtual reality education programs, which is um, something we've been focused on through Tech for Nature as well. Um, and then on the clean tech side, so we've also been focused on supporting clean tech ventures that are using technology to, to make nature-based climate solutions more cost effective, to help them scale faster, to be more efficient. Um, and one example is a really cool company that's come through a couple of our uh, tech accelerator supported programs. It's called Flash Forest. Um, and they've developed this great technology using drones automation and ecology science to try and revolutionize reforestation. So they've actually created the solutions where like fleets of drones will go out uh, and reforest certain areas for a fraction of the cost of a human tree planter and at a much uh, faster speed and much greater scale than what could previously be achieved. Um, so I just think that's such a great example of how technology can play an important role uh, in helping accelerate conservation efforts, but there's obviously lots more to, to talk about as well. Yeah, absolutely. That is a fantastic example. And well, geez, you gave a whole list and it's really uh, tackling it from every aspect. Uh, Michelle, what about the role of technology and conservation at Microsoft? Can you share some of your best examples? Sure, I'd be delighted to. Uh, and they pick up on that same theme. I think when it comes to um, protecting biodiversity and investing in nature, everyone understands that it's important. And then there are a lot of dollars that are starting to flow into that space. And that's really where the data runs out. Um, I think one of the things that we, when we started looking at the state of biodiversity and ecosystems from a technology first standpoint, um, we always go to the data and it turns out that um, we have a lot of data on humans. We do not ne have nearly enough that is at a granular level of detail that's updated on a real-time basis to really have a good handle on how much 
is where, how it's changed yeah. over time, and make any real accurate predictions about what we're going to do moving forward. And that impacts everything from what kind of land easements and land conservations you make in policy planning decisions around wetlands, around city planning, um, all the way down to what are the right incentives to offer that can actually change market behavior around protecting trees all the way down to the data that you need to actually build up net new markets, which is in some ways what we're dealing with when it comes to um, investments in nature. Yes, there have been a lot of nature-based offsets that have been available, um, but that it really only makes up a pretty small fraction of what we think is necessary on the market um, in order to meet goals or to really change behavior. Um, agriculture is a great example. Um, uh, right now, agriculture is a problem when it comes to greenhouse gases. It has the potential to go from problem to opportunity and become a net sink. Well, we need a lot of data to understand um, how deep soil sequestration happens, what happens when no-till and cover crops start to come together, um, because we know that those things can help, um, but how much and at what level farmers should be compensated and how to drive behavior change, it's all really dependent on that data collection, monitoring, and then predictive analytics moving forward. So we've been doing that work really across the board. And I think what, what Brian mentioned is that it kind of starts with this base level of building better maps, basically, building a better understanding of geospatial awareness and all of those individual assets that can be counted. Um, and we have done that work. Um, one of my favorite projects is a project that we did um, with was Sylvia Terra, now NCX, um, that actually did the first ever map in the United States of how many trees are where, what species, height, diameter, because those are all really important to understand sequestration, not enough to understand how many trees, um, but all of those um, start to impact that. So now we don't just have a map of forests, we have a map of sequestration potential. We've continued to build on that work um, across biomass with Carbon Direct and some other organizations. Um, and then in Canada, it's not just about um, we started to expand that work out too. So we've been working with the government of Canada to build out a, their very first public-private partnership around cloud data and AI aimed directly at natural resources and understanding the map of what's available um, and to build that out from a scientific, scientific cooperation standpoint. Um, and then we've also worked through a grants program that we have. It's um, actually what made us super excited about the nature and carbon um, approach here is that we know that there are a ton of great data scientists out there that want to work on the hardest products hardest problem. This is it. And we know that there are a ton of environmental scientists out there that really want to scale up their work and move a lot faster. And so through partnerships like this and what we've done with AI for Earth, we can bring those synergies together across them. Um, and one of those projects in Canada has been around uh, groundwater and ground soil remediation with Wikinet. And so how do we not only do a better job of protecting what's there, but we also have quite a bit of work to do on cleanup and really remediation. And they have started to use AI to detect places where that remediation is particularly important and then um, come up with some decision analysis about the right ways to engage in that. And that led us all the way to a different company um, that is working um, in Mexico right now about using organic microbes for soil um, and groundwater remediation. And so we've realized that um, you know we have a lot of um, capabilities to add more data to the puzzle, but more data doesn't really help us if we don't have easier ways to access that. Because as much as we would like, um, not everyone's a data scientist, not everybody needs to know how to work a Jupyter notebook. We just need to have better data to answer uh, to ask harder questions and to get better answers in a hurry. And that in a nutshell is really what we're focused on is how do we bring in better data to enable better decision making? OK, so Michelle, this is like, come on, everything you said was incredibly fascinating and I'm super excited. What awesome projects you're working on? My, but some of us, you know, in the webinar might be thinking to, to what end? Like, yes, the planet, but why Microsoft? Why are you, uh, why is focusing in, on nature part of your climate strategy? How does that fit? Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, there's a long answer, but we, we are short on time, so I'll not give yeah. the long answer. I'll give the short <laughs> answer, which is, 
Really twofold. Um, one is that we simply can't reach our corporate commitments without um, taking a nature first strategy. Um, we have commitments around carbon negative that we know are going to continue to rely on nature based offsets to make up a large portfolio of that. Um, we think that there are a lot more projects that need to be entered into the market and we need to have an eye on quality to make sure that dollars are flowing to the right place. So we, we can't get to carbon negative by 2030 without nature. Uh, it's, it's that simple for us. Um, the slightly longer answer is that we've also made commitments um, outside of carbon to become a water positive company, a zero waste company, and around ecosystems to protect more land than we use and to build something that we call the plant planetary computer, which is how uh, all of those things I just mentioned on data and usability were actually coming together in a pretty simple kind of uh, database um, and web query system. Um, but for us, the ecosystem piece um, and all of this data is really important to the planet. It's important to our commitments. Um, but I would encourage folks to think about investing as nature is not just an obligation, um, but it's an opportunity. Um, we see that there is a, an incredible market um, really to be opened here um, for the first time, not pitting nature, protecting nature against growth, but actually figuring out how to marry those two things together. Um, we know that they're going to be an incredibly important part of how the economy and the um, world transitions um, and that there are there are already a lot of dollars flowing into it. Um, we want to make those to be as smart as possible. And so we view this as core to our commitments, uh, core to the planet, but also really core to um, a harmonious and just um, economic transition that we'll see across the board. But I want to ask you a specific question about uh, Microsoft recently launched a vision for a planetary computer. How does that effort advance, or how might it, I guess is a better question, how might it advance nature-based climate solutions in a country like Canada? Uh, we think it has a lot of potential um, around the world and especially in Canada. That planetary computer um, is really that um, that data plus um, APIs, easy applications to use on top of that um, that I was just describing. Um, what we have already seen um, it be useful in doing is to get to um, some of those quantification exercises to get to a valuation exercise. And by that, I mean it's um, really helping us understand um, already in Canada what uh, the biomass looks like. Um, so both from trees and from additional resources, um, what is there? Um, what are the sequestration potentials over top of it? And so we're starting to develop um, one of those early applications. It's really almost a, a sequestration heat map um, related directly to forestry. So helping us really understand where the sequestration is happening most effectively right now so we can make sure that that's preserved, um, where there are places with great potential potential um, so we can help um, make smart decisions about reforesting in those areas. Um, and then we're also looking outside of just forestry and soil, started to look at um, how we are um, interacting with water and how some of those uh, activities are starting to change over time. So we're looking at both ocean but also freshwater. So we've started to develop some applications that help us understand um, how much access to water there is. We know that water is not really part of the nature-based um, portfolio today, but it's incredibly important. We're starting through the data overlays to be able to better understand that um, how you start to unlock some of those triple wins that we talk about in the sustainability space where we get um, both sequestration, but also economic um, impact also that comes with ecosystem benefits and so as we are able to start to piece those things together we're able to really make a case not just for um you know investing in uh better protection of hardwoods based on the value on the carbon market but its overall value to the rest of the communities from the services that it provides um in water uh, what it provides in terms of arable land um flood and erosion prevention and with all of those things together you're starting to get a better view of how we put value on nature not just on what can be bought and sold but for all of the services that it delivers and that's uh, what we're starting to see in the u.s in Canada in particular. Thanks, Michelle. There, yeah, there's lots of solutions for Canada, a country like Canada. That's super. Uh, Brian, welcome back. I know you had a, a little tech hiccup. I'm glad you're back. Glad you were able to dial back in. I was just about to ask you a question that we got um, asked by one of the attendees about reconciling the fact that RBC is a bank that it, um, invests directly in the fossil fuel industry. And you, you messaged me and said you'd like to answer that question. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this is a common question, of course, that, that we've been fielding a lot uh, recently. So we need to recognize that there's a need for lots of different kinds of energy solutions right now to meet the energy demands of the planet. And the unfortunate reality is that the reliance on traditional sources of energy is going to continue for some time while we change what energy we consume and, and how it's produced. And one other thing that RBC is cognizant of is that jobs and prosperity of every Canadians uh, of every Canadian is also needs to be considered in this conversation. And um, the energy sector is still a major part of the economy and a major source of jobs for for many Canadians. So that needs to be preserved and transitioned while we build the more sustainable economy that we're all striving for. And getting this transition right, it's, it's not easy, uh, but we're also going to have to move forward together. And we know we have to do this with a sense of urgency um, and that we're going to be really thoughtful in our actions. And we view our role in this um, as one of a, a partner where we partner closely with our clients to support their net zero and sustainability plans, including clients in the oil and gas sector. And that's where we think we can have the major, the, the best positive impact through what we do best, which is providing financing and advice to our clients. And uh, we've also committed to monitoring, measuring and reporting on our clients' efforts towards net zero emissions. So actually in early 2022, we're gonna publicly share data on emissions produced by our clients that are associated with loans, investments, uh, financial services, and, and products, uh, better referred to as financed emissions. And at the same time, we're also gonna set interim goals in support of achieving our commitment to net zero emissions in our lending by 2050. And I just wanna add that um, even amongst our clients, the ones that we work with most closely in the oil and gas sector, nearly all have publicly outlined clear carbon reduction objectives or net zero commitments. Um, we've also published policy restrictions stating will not directly finance the development of new thermal coal or coal power plants. And we are a huge supporter of the renewable energy, clean transportation and other low carbon sectors. Um, and this is increasingly a focus for us. So um, currently we're, we're trying to address the needs of all our clients and, and the Canadian economy and public at large. Um, but it's going to have to be done in kind of a more measured and thoughtful approach. Uh, so that that's currently how we're approaching this. Great. Thanks for taking that question. And we'll look forward to the release of uh, that analysis in 2022. I am looking at the time and we're just over half past, but this is a great conversation. So one more question uh, that I'll offer to both of you. This is the Nature Meets Carbon Tech Challenge that we're here for. So I'll start with you, Brian. Tell us why you're excited about Nature Meets Carbon Tech Challenge. Yeah, we're, we're so excited about uh, the Nature Meets Carbon Tech Challenge, um, mostly because the ventures and solutions that will emerge have the potential to support so much of our work. Um, so I didn't get to touch on kind of how we're approaching nature-based climate solutions. It's part of our strategy, it's part of our environmental donations, um, but it's a huge focus for us. And we know that having quantifiable data is going to be really important in driving this whole sector forward and it, it's going to be super important for anything that we do here so uh, just as an example whether it's lending to a forestry product project um, investing in sustainable agriculture or finding new partners innovating in this space through tech for nature data is going to be really key and that measurement piece is going to be really key to help build the business cases or the social impact cases um, for carbon sequestration and doing that through nature-based climate solutions. Um, so I'm really excited to see what, what companies and technologies emerge out of this challenge. And I just want to say good luck to all the ventures and, and we can't wait to see your solutions and, and hopefully work with you on them in the future. Agreed. Michelle, what about you? Why are you excited about this challenge? Ah, well, I echo all of that. Um, too. <laughs> I think, um, we're really excited to be working with uh, two partners that we um, have a deep amount of respect for and have done incredible work um, together already on this and WWF and RBC. So we're, we're excited for that part. Um, 
but you know, I mentioned at the beginning that we um, we we started with ambition and, and built the roadmap um, back out of that. Our roadmap really depends on uh, new solutions, new entrepreneurs, and new um, innovators entering the space. Um, we are really eager to support this with our technology, um, which is something that Microsoft has brought to the challenge, as well as mentoring sessions. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that we know is that um, sort of uh, the science between environmental science and data science is not the same, and it needs to be a lot closer um, and we are really excited to bring our folks that have done that work together to this community. Um, but I think put simply is that, you know, all of the projections that we've looked at indicate that we have um, two very big gaps. We have a really big gap in our ability to close the um, gap that we've got in progress towards 1.5. Um, so it means that whatever we have right now on the table in terms of solutions are not being adopted quickly enough or not scaling enough or simply don't exist. So we've got to close that gap to get to 1.5. Um, and we have to close a pretty big uh, gap in terms of innovation in this space to get to the market projections that we're seeing on the financial side. So we see sort of a huge amount of unmet need um, and a lot of emerging capabilities that are scaling up um, much more quickly than we thought they could before. So we're really excited to be sort of the foundation technology layer um, and be an accelerator because we need it to get to 2030. The world needs it to get to 2030 and beyond. Um, and we think that there's just a tremendous opportunity to um, do well for companies by doing good um, in this space. Excellent. Michelle Lancaster, Global Director of Sustainability at Microsoft. Brian Hong, Senior Manager, Social Impact, RBC Tech for Nature. Uh, you're both very busy people, so thanks for the extra minutes you gave us, and thank you for everything you brought to this discussion. I just loved hearing from both of you, and I know that uh, everybody who joined us did as well. So everyone, I hope you're all leaving today feeling inspired and energized by what was presented here today. I know that I am. And I hope that some of you will turn that inspiration into tangible ideas that you'll submit through the Tech Challenge. If you have a technology that can measure carbon in nature, we want you to apply to the Nature Meets Carbon Tech Challenge. Submit your proposal by November 8th to be considered for our incredible awards package. Who knew there's awards as well? Uh, visit techhub.wwf.ca. So I'm sure someone can put that in the chat, techhub.wwf.ca to see all the details. And if you have questions about the challenge, please do reach out to us. It's a pretty easy email address, challenge at wwfcanada.org. I want to thank all of our speakers from today, Angela, Garrett, Craig, Michelle, and James, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. The Nature Meets Carbon Tech Challenge is supported by founding partner RBC Tech for Nature and national technology sponsor Microsoft. Please be sure to follow our channels where we'll be sharing updates on the challenge. Thanks everyone. <laughs>